Good morning, Asbury. It's nice to see your bright eyes this morning. Can't see anything else, but I can see your eyes. <laughs> um, the announcements for this week are in your bulletin, except for a couple. Um, the Finance Committee will be meeting on Thursday, the 25th at 6 p.m. Uh, and the trustees will meet on Sunday, the 28th at 2.30 p.m. So if you're on those committees, be sure and write that down so that you'll remember. If you would please join me in prayer. Most gracious God, Father of heaven and earth, open wide the windows of our spirit and fill us full of light. Open wide the doors of our hearts that we may receive and entertain thee with all our powers of adoration and love. Amen. Please stand and join me in singing Love Divine, All Love Excelling. remain standing for the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This hymn is found on page 269, Lord, who out these 40 days. i 
may be seated. Good morning, church. Uh, today I have an update uh, for you about children's ministry, and I just want to let you know that our Sunday school is going great. Our kids are learning a lot, they're having fun, and they're making new friends. Uh, we also uh, have our choir, our sign language choir, and the kids are almost ready for Easter, so don't miss it. Be here and see them sing with their hands. It's going to be great. Uh, another uh, announcement that I have for all of you is that on Easter Sunday we will have an egg hunt, uh, a family event for our children their families. We will have snacks and uh, games and some other things, and that's on April 4th. And the good news that I want to share with you today is about Vacation Bible School. As you know, we didn't have that last year, but we are having VBS this year. So I want to encourage you, all of you, if you uh, are willing to help in any way for VBS, you know it's a lot of work, but it's something great for our church. So if you are uh, willing to help in any kind of help, please let me know. We are going to start planning that pretty soon. So I want to, to ask all of you to be praying for this uh, because our children, is, uh, they're very important to our congregation. So let's, let's have a time of prayer for our, our kids and also for the uh, alarm that we're all getting in our phones. Let's pray. Dear God, we want to thank you this morning for our children. We thank you because you take care of them. We thank you because you are always uh, teaching them, showing yourself to them. Dear God, we ask for you to help us so that we can guide our children in your path. We pray for that alarm that we just got. Whoever is in danger, God, please help them. We ask all these things, Lord, knowing that you always hear us and that you're always with us. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. Please bow with me for the offering prayer. God of compassion, when we fail to keep your commandments and rebelled against that which would bring peace and joy to our lives, your love was so great that you offered us a new covenant, not written on tablets, but on our hearts. In our giving and in all our offerings, may, we, may it be our lives, our love and devotion that we bring to your altar. May we remember in our giving that you loved us so much that the sacrifice of your son on the cross for us was not too great a cost. Our gifts are meager in comparison, but let them remind us of what you gave first. In Christ we pray, amen. Please stand for the doxology. Hello, my name is Eddie Rivera. I'm the El Paso District Superintendent. In the past year, we have seen how the pandemic has affected so many churches all around the world and in our communities as well. And in the midst of all of this, I have two questions for you. One is, do you think God is waiting for the pandemic to pass so that he can then continue transforming the world? And for us United Methodist people, do you think God is waiting for the General Conference to make its decision about our future so that after that decision is made, God then can continue transforming the world? Well, I believe that God is not waiting. I believe that God is transforming people all around us in ways that we cannot see. I believe that the Holy Spirit is moving in people's lives even as we speak. Hi, I'm Nicole Crouch, the Director of Missional Ministries for the El Paso District. Throughout this pandemic, our local churches have faced many challenges. 
Yet they have also tuned into the Holy Spirit and begun to do new things. We have seen churches worshiping in new ways, reaching out to new people in their communities and beyond, accepting new members, and beginning new ministries. Our local churches have offered financial assistance to vulnerable people, provided food pantry assistance, begun new ministries with children and youth, and are working on starting even more new ministries, such as Celebrate Recovery. These are just a few of the ways we have seen the Holy Spirit at work in the El Paso District. Thank you, Nicole. The Bible says in Isaiah 43, 19, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. We believe that God indeed is doing great new things in our district. But the only way to discover that is through prayer. So we are inviting you to join us in a season of prayer. From Easter Sunday to Pentecost Sunday, we will have seven weeks of guided prayer and reflection. We will provide you with a plan so that you can participate in this season of prayer. At the end of this time, we know and we believe that God will prepare us to do great things in ministry for the years to come. At the end of our seven weeks together, we will gather to celebrate virtually and share the ways that we have discerned the Holy Spirit is at work and where the Holy Spirit is calling us to go. Pentecost Sunday, which is also Aldersgate Sunday in the United Methodist Church, calls us to remember our history as the church and where God has been at work in the world. And while we remember, we also reflect on where God is calling us to go to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in our world. We look forward to journeying together with you into tuning into the Holy Spirit over these seven weeks. We look forward to hearing how you grow and where the Holy Spirit is calling your churches to engage the world in a COVID and post-COVID era. May God bless you and keep you until we meet again. And may the power of the Holy Spirit continue to guide your steps into the future ministry that we have in common. God bless you. Well, good morning, everyone. Soon, very soon, we have lived different things in a, in a year. A lot of ups and downs in our society, in our community, in our world, in our local church. But God is faithful. God has been faithful. And we can testify of that. We have, we're, we're getting closer to the time where we will see an end to something that has uh, affected us tremendously. Some of us have lost people we love. Some of us have lost members of our families, close people uh, to our hearts due to the pandemic or any other circumstance, and just the pandemic made it difficult for us to say goodbye or almost impossible. But we're here to testify that our God is still in control. We're here to testify that God is a sovereign God, and that He will take care of us. We're here in the last Sunday of the season of Lent to make sure that we will not miss on God's voice and message to our lives. And so one of the things that we were encouraged to do is to be in prayer. And this is something that God has been encouraging us for a while to do, to pray. And once again, I want to encourage you to write in those cards and those who are watching online, let us know how can we pray for you. There will come a day, I hope, that we will realize and that we will understand and be reminded that prayer works. That it is not this magic thing that we do, but it is the power of God revealed in the miracles that surround us. And we will see those. So how can we pray for you? We have people in our church family who are in need of prayer. We have people who we love in this church family who are in need of our prayers. We have uh, our, our friend Gertrude Merritt, who is st still uh, in need of prayers. Uh, she uh, went back to the hospital because of different situations that, that she went through. If you're interested to know what, what she's going through, please talk to uh, Marilyn Angelis. 
Uh, she's been uh, informing us of everything, but we, I can tell you that Gertrude is still uh, needs our prayers uh, for her to recover from the different things that she's dealing with. Bobby Vandenberg, he's going to have surgery tomorrow, and so we need to pray for him as well. So how can we pray for you? How can we pray for your family? How can we pray for your children, your grandchildren, anything that is in your heart? Let us know by writing that in your cards. And I would like to encourage you today as we go to the Lord in prayer, pray for those things that, that you have in your heart. Pray for those things that are bothering you. Pray for those things that are getting in the way between you and God. Pray that everything that our enemy, Satan, wants to build, all those uh, uh, obstacles for our lives in our faith will be turned down for God's glory and for our relationship with God to grow and be even, even greater. And so we have this great time today at church to pray. So I would like to invite you to join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this beautiful day that you have given us. We know that you are the giver of life, giver of hope. You, Lord, who gives grace and mercy every morning. As the Bible says that your mercies are new every morning, God, we can attest that that is true. That we're here tasting the sweetness of your mercy of your forgiveness and your redemption. Heavenly Father, we come today to give you honor and worship. We come today, Lord, to deny ourselves, to humble ourselves so that you can be glorified. We come today, Lord, not just to uh, leave a, a small time of our days to be with you, but to surrender everything that we have and we are before you. Heavenly Father, we continue, Lord, to pray for this uh, uh, pandemic that has affected our people and our society, our world. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ that very soon we will see an end to this, but that we will learn, God, the lessons that were, uh, that were taught all through this last year. Lord, that we will realize that your hand and your presence have not left our sides, that you are faithful, that even in our struggles and in our storms in our lives, because it has been a long year, it has been a long year of loss, a long year of trials, of stress, anxiety, that you have remained faithful. God, help us see your mighty, work at, your mighty work and your mighty hand of working in our lives, in our midst. We pray for all those brothers and sisters, friends of ours, and those whose names are, are printed in the bulletin. We pray for, for them to be in, in your hands. We pray for Mary Cool as well. We pray for all those who, who, who are dealing with COVID. We pray that you will restore their lives and their bodies completely. We pray for those who are getting ready for surgery. We pray that you will be with them and bless the, the doctors and to do a good job. We pray for those who are recovering from surgeries or, or those, Lord, who are recovering from any procedures. We pray that you, uh, Lord, help them in their recovery. And God, we pray for those who have lost someone they love. We pray for those who are grieving, those who are still uh, broken. We pray for your restoration and your mighty hand to be with them and hold them. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be present in our church and in our churches, in our community. We pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will not be held by anyone or anything, but that we will see your mighty hand at work. Lord, we pray that today, the last Sunday in Lent, will be a special time for us. That this will be a time of preparation, God, to the celebration that, that is coming. But help us, Lord, to acknowledge that in order to experience life, something has to die. And as we learn this lesson, we ask that you open our hearts to receive your word. 
Lord, we continue praying for your will to be done. And we do so by remembering the words that Jesus taught his disciples. And we pray this prayer not as a repetition or something that we do as a routine every Sunday, but as a belief that we have in you. And as an honest request for you to come and do your will. And so, Lord, together at one voice, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may remain in your seats as we sing, Change My Heart, O God. Change my heart, O God, make it Please stand with me for the word of God. <clears throat> now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for an eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from this earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the gospel of the Christ our Lord.
Please be seated. This is it. This is our last Sunday of the season of Lent. And it brings with it the last lesson. We have been working on this sermon series called Lessons of Lent. And we have learned some lessons that you may think, well, we all know that. <laughs> well, good. Lessons that we grow up hearing, lessons that we grow up at, since we come to church, since we're little kids at church, they teach us these lessons. But every once in a while, we need a reminder. Because it seems like our society is not so different than the people of Israel, and we often forget. And so the lessons that we have learned, first of all, in lesson number one, week number one of the season of Lent, was that Lent is about love. That if we don't talk about God's love in the season of Lent, then the message is incomplete. And it becomes a selfish lie because it becomes a human effort and not God's grace. So it is about God, and that is our lesson number two. It is about love, and it is about God, and not ourselves. Though God loves us so much, and He gave His one and only Son, and it seems sometimes that He has put us in the center of the universe, we are not the center of the universe. Although we are His perfect and beautiful creation, we are not perfect as He is. We are not the potter. We are the clay. And the thing about that is that there are times that the final result is not what pleases Him. And you know what happens next? Brokenness. We are broken once again to be formed at the perfect image of our Lord. So it is about God. And then lesson number three and week number three taught us of the zeal of God and the jealousy that at times we miss having. The jealousy that Jesus Christ himself had at the moment that he went to the temple and turned the tables because the things that were done in that place were not pleasing to God. I've heard many pastors and people ask, can you imagine how many tables he would flip nowadays in our church? Let me tell you, it will look like a mess. Lesson number three encourages us to be part of that holy zeal that comes from God. That pain that we should feel in our hearts as Christians when the will of our Father is not being done. Lesson number four, week number four, told us about a story that salvation comes to those who turn their eyes upon Jesus. That in our lives, when we leave our comfort and we look at the cross of Jesus, an empty cross, we experience salvation. But that cross was not always empty. It is empty now, but it was not always empty. It required the sacrifice of the Son of God, our friend, to get us that salvation. And so when we turn our eyes upon Him, the giver and redeemer, then we experience that salvation. That's the fourth lesson in Lent. And now we come to the fifth week, the last week in the season of Lent. And today's lesson is the toughest one to hear, to accept and to embrace. It is a lesson that no one can better teach than our Lord Jesus Christ himself. But before we hear this lesson, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you open our hearts and our souls to receive the word that you have in store for us. And We pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's Lenten season is about dying. It's about learning how to die. And of course, we're not talking about a physical death. 
We're not talking about preparation for our funerals and what hymns we want to be uh, sang. And, no, we're not talking about a physical death. We're talking about the death to our flesh, to our passions, to our desires, and to our sins. Now, in this life, we spend so much time learning how to live. We uh, are surrounded by magazines and articles and places where they teach us and they teach you what the best way is for you to live your life. We are flooded in the internet and people love to go into the internet and research how to do it yourself. DIY projects. I'll tell you something, every time I try one of those, it never ends the right way. I, there's this man teaching you how to work wood and how to do this cabinet. I give it a try. It's not working. But every time we turn our, our, our eyes to a different place in this, word, in this word, world, we find those lessons on how you should live your life, how to work your money, how to do your taxes, how to be healthier, how to, you know, all this how to have a better life. Since we're babies, we must learn our first lesson on how to live, on what life is about. And the first lesson that we, we experience when we come to this world is to breathe. The doctors take the baby and they make sure that that baby has learned the first lesson. Breathe. A lesson that we often forget when we grow older and we forget to stop and take a breath. And so every step of the way in our lives, we are learning how to live. But how often do we hear those lessons that teach us how to die? Death is something that will inevitably come to every single one of us. We will all experience the physical death. But I don't see very often places in which we're taught how to die. How, so how do we understand Jesus' words in today's scripture? When Jesus said, those who love their life, lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Again, these are words that are in, in our Bible marked with a red collar. And we know that that's important because those are the words that Jesus proclaimed himself. And this is where the season of Lent comes into play. This season is centered around giving something up. Lent is always uh, surrounded by this emotion and sentiment and encouragement for us to give something up. I don't know how many of you gave something up. It seems like we've already given things up since this pandemic hit. It seems like we're already giving life up the way we knew it. Some of us gave up chocolate. Or social media. Whatever it is. The season of Lent encourages us to give something up. But we took it a step forward. And we, and we dare to say it's not just about giving something up. It's about giving ourselves completely. And giving ourselves up completely. Not just chocolate. Though we love it. But to give ourselves up completely. Denying ourselves, quieting our inner human desires that may distract us from a daily devotion with our Lord. Now, it happens to all of us. Just think about it. It is easier for us to turn the TV on than to open our Bibles. There's no remote to open our Bible. Although we already have those in our cell phones and tablets and computer, and you can find a Bible pretty much everywhere you go. You go to the Hampton Inn, there's a Bible in that drawer. If you're like me, you're pretty much giving your Bible a ride everywhere you go in your dashboard, in, the, in your car. But it is easier for us to get the remote and turn the TV on than to open our Bibles and sit down in a quiet time. It is easier for human beings to get our phones and call our friends than to bend our knees and talk to God. 
oftentimes we feel like prayer is our last resource when God wants us to use it every moment of our lives and the first resource. We call the pastor, we call a friend, we call our family members, and we try to pour our hearts, and then at the end we leave the presence of God. It is easier to deny our feelings and our emotions and our struggles than to take them to the Lord in prayer. Now, you may be thinking, well, not necessarily. You know, I have experienced how easy it is to go to my Father in heaven and pour my heart completely. If that is you, let me tell you, congratulations. Take it to the Lord in prayer. But there's a part in in our humanity that keeps trying to convince us that it is easier to hide our imperfections than to confess our sins. It is easier for me to hide my sins and imperfections from all of you than it is to take those to the Lord and confess. And that's where he comes, that that phrase. It's strong. But the reality is that we have not been wearing masks to church for only a year. For so long, we wear masks saying everything's okay, I'm okay, I am good, I feel great, my family is in the best place it can be, my heart is full, I have joy. How many of us come on Sunday morning and just talk to a friend and when they ask you, how are you doing? I am completely broken. Oh, what do you do if someone responds to you like that? Um... Okay? It is easy for human beings to deny the situations that we go through. But Jesus showed us an alternative. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to this world. Because somewhere down the road in history of humanity, the main lesson became learning how to live. And Jesus came into the picture, the Son of God, a person of the Trinity, God in the flesh came to this world and changed those dynamics. Jesus' message was, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That was his message. And he was talking about us. In order for us to bear the fruit that God desires, we must die. These are not my words. This is Jesus' words. See, this principle stated in, the, in verse 24 is of a wide application. You know, we can talk about it in different angles. But in particular, if it is true of Jesus then it must be true for us, his followers. If Jesus has to die, then we must do it as well. Because it would be easy for the disciples to think, well, Jesus is going to the cross. Jesus is going to the cross. Thank heaven I don't have to do that. But Jesus' message was, follow me. Follow me. Pick up your cross, deny yourself, die to yourself, and follow me. This is the message that Jesus has had to give. Jesus uses that, that metaphor of the grain of wheat to illustrate the importance of ego death. Ego death in the pursuit of salvation, in entering the kingdom of heaven. Of ego death. Because if we don't die to ourselves, if we don't die to our ego, then how can we follow the places that he is going? I saw a picture not long ago of a, a, it's a cartoon, a little, you know, cartoon of a, a, a man carrying a cross. And that cross was so big and so tall and heavy that, that he turns to heaven and says, God, please make it lighter. And he cuts apart. 
And then he keeps walking and says, it's still too heavy, make it lighter. And he cuts another part. And he keeps on walking and that happens a couple of times. And then he comes to a place where there's a big gap there in the road. There's that, uh, how do you call that? The... All right, I got four different words. It comes to a place where he needs the cross to, cr- to go, to literally cross from one end to the other. And guess what? It's too short. Because God knew exactly how much it took and how long that cross had to be. And God never gives us something that we can't take. Now you can tell me, oh, that's crazy talking because I can barely stand in this trial. God, don't love me so much to give me all these trials. But God knows how big that jump has to be and how great the cross is to help us go from one end to the other. But oftentimes we pray things like, God, and I don't know if you, I, don't, I hope you don't feel offended if you are one who carries this around in a bumper sticker or you have this at home, but we pray Bless this mess. Bless this mess. And we believe it. But what if God is standing before us and says, I don't want to bless your mess. I want to clean it. And this is what the season of Lent brings to us today. The message for the Lenten season has always been repent and believe in the gospel. Repent. And believe in the gospel. Since the moment we get a cross on our foreheads on Ash Wednesday, which just to make things 2020, 2021 appropriate, we didn't have a Ash Wednesday service. But we know that a cross is marked on our foreheads. And when the ashes are put in there, we are reminded of our mortality. And we are told, repent and believe in the gospel. So how then can we learn this important lesson? How can we learn to die? See, a good example is repentance. For it involves a certain type of death. Death to sin. Now, the Bible is full. Every single book tells us about forgiveness and repentance and sin Every single book of the Bible. Since the moment we open our Bibles in the first book in Genesis until the end. The Bible provides many examples of things that we must die to. I'm going to give you just a quick, a short list. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists And that he rewards those who seek him. So the first thing that we need to die to is the sin of unbelief. Unbelief has always been something that people of God struggle with. They couldn't believe in the God that opened and parted the seas. They couldn't believe the things that were happening even though they were happening right in front of their eyes. We must die to the sin of unbelief. Because without faith... It is impossible to please God. Acts 5.29 says, We must obey God rather than men. I don't know about you, but they're tempted. Pastors are tempted to be people pleasers. Because if you don't like me, you'll go to the other church. Because if you don't like what is taught and preached in the pulpit, you quit coming. Or... Some pastors were there to say, worse, you'll quit sending your money. But the Bible tells us very clearly that it is important for us to obey God rather than men. To die to the idolatry, not just of images, but of self and others. Because no one and nothing is above God. He should be praised. Romans 12 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind by testing, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 
We're encouraged to die to the spiritual and religious conformism. We conform to this world. We conform to our routines. We conform to the things that, uh, and we build our, our, our uh, comfort zones. We all have our comfort zones. That's okay. But when God asks us to get out of those comfort zones, and we are unable to do that, then those comfort zones have gone beyond what they have to be. We must die to our spiritual and religious conformism. Matthew 10, 28 says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Die to the, the sin of fear. Do you know this is the, the commandment that we find in the Bible often and often? The, the one that is repeated the most all through the Bible. The one commandment, because this is a commandment. The one commandment that is repeated all through the scripture is do not fear. Do not fear. And that is God's message. Don't fear. I am with you. Do not be afraid. Be courageous. Die to the sin of fear. Romans 6, 1 through 4. And this is the last one that I want to share with you. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised, was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Sin. Die to sin. Die to sin. And you know who showed us the perfect example of this? You know who taught us how to die to sin. Brothers and sisters, these are verses of the word of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. And they carry a deep message. And they carry confrontation and boldness and power. But they also carry hope. They also carry forgiveness Mercy, grace, love, and redemption. Sin comes in all shapes and forms. Sin comes into our lives as a subtle, little, honest, innocent thing. And sometimes we miss it. Satan is an expert on what he does. He's old. He has experience. But he's never going to be more powerful than our Lord. He's never going to be able to hold us because we have been redeemed and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Now God, as we learned last week, He does not want to condemn us. He wants to save us. And he gave his one and only son to do that. God, and let me be clear, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, who is one God and who is the same yesterday and today and forever, is not a villain. He is light to the darkness. He is holy. He is pure. He is wise. And he is the author of life. And he is the author of salvation. He is our awesome God, and he sent his son to this world, to a life worth of admiration and imitation. Christ should be our example of living and of dying. Jesus taught us how to live, but he also taught us how to die. In his death, in his physical death, in the crucifixion, Jesus paid the penalty that was ours. His blood cleansed our impurities and imperfections and our endless sins. He lived and died so that we can do the same. 
So when you are given that heavy, long cross, don't get a chainsaw. God knows what He's doing. And though sorrow and hurt may come through the night, and you have those, those long nights in which your stomach cannot let you sleep because you're carrying a burden that is bigger and greater and heavier than what you can take. And when you are tempted to cut that cross a little bit just to make it lighter, come to God. And He will give you hope. And He will give you rest. And He will remind you, you can do it. I am with you. It was King Solomon, the wisest king that Israel ever had, who once said, For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born. And may I add, and learn how to breathe, and a time to die. Brothers and sisters, the time has come. The time is upon us, and the call is for everyone, and the invitation makes no exclusion. The time in which we die to ourselves so that He may live in us. The time in which we can proclaim the words that Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And as we heard earlier, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, said Jesus, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, if it dies, it bears much fruit. The hour is coming. The rugged cross is ready. The heartbeats increase as we approach the time in which we will remember what Jesus endured and what he went through. To see the act, the greatest act of love that humanity has ever experienced. Church, the time is near. But the promise still remains. And the promise is that Easter is coming. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we present ourselves before you as your church. Not to pray and to ask that you bless this mess, but to ask that you will bless us by molding us into the image that you have for us. We give you all honor and glory with everything that we do, we say, we think. In the name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me, stand and join me singing the final hymn, Give Me Jesus.
seated. I would like to invite Sharon. I would like to uh, tell you, church, that every, uh, we have received another family into our membership of our church in the late service last Sunday, and we're celebrating that. And we had a baptism last Sunday in the late service as well. And we have a liturgy where we welcome people into the life of the church, and it's beautiful, and we always say it together. But we also have a liturgy in our church that is to give someone a farewell when they are leaving. And today I would like to invite Sharon Autumn. And I would like to invite you to join me in this liturgy. Sharon has been here longer than I have for sure. Sharon has been serving in different areas in our church, in choir. She plays the guitar every time we have communion for background music. She has a special heart that God loves. And Sharon is ready to start a new chapter in her life. And she's going to be moving. Is that right, Sharon? Yes. Retiring. Retiring. And congratulations. Thank you. And she's going to be moving to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And this is her last Sunday with us. So, Sharon, we want to honor you and the things that you've done in our church. And we have a gift for you. Sharon is very talented. She makes uh, cards and all kinds of things. I have them displayed in my office. Very artistic. And Sharon, we want to say goodbye to you the proper way. Best way we can. With all our hearts and our love. So hear this farewell to Sharon from the book of worship. The church is a family. United by the common recognition of Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are all brothers and sisters, and for a time, Asbury is our home. Like every human family, our church family is formed and reformed over time. As members are born, as they die, as members are adopted into our family, and as they leave our congregation for a new home and a different place. For a time, Sharon has lived with us. We have shared with each other good times and bad times. We have shared each other's joys and sorrows. We have lightened each other's heavy loads. Together we have laughed and cried. Together we have worshipped and praised God. Together we have lived. Congregation, please join me in these words. We feel sorrow in your living Yet we rejoice with you in anticipation of this new phase of your life. We will miss your love and support. Yet we know you will add much to the lives of those who will be your new church family. As you have added much to our lives. We will pray for you and for the whole family of God. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the strength and the protector of your people. We humbly place in your hands Sharon Odom of this congregation who is about to leave us. Keep and preserve her, O oh Lord, in all health, in all health and safety, both of body and soul, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Church, I will invite you to take a moment to say uh, goodbye to Sharon. We're still dealing with COVID. Sharon, if you uh, don't like hugs right now, just do us a cross like that, okay? <laughs> we love you, Sharon. Church, I ask you to stand, please, as we receive the benediction for today. And another cross will be, will be in the foyer in, in, in honor of everything that you have done for our church and who you are for this church, Sharon. And now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you everywhere you go, teaching you the lessons not just of Lent, but of the Master and Giver of life, our Teacher Jesus Christ, that we may live and die for His glory. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.